enthusiast since 1998 and a key contributor to the open source community as a founding member of the Python Software Foundation and the Twisted Project. He brings a wealth of experience. Today, Mosha will unravel the mysteries of content yourself. Please join me in welcoming Mosha Jatka. Thank you so much. Um, okay, cool. So we're starting it a bit late, but hopefully, uh, I think uh, I definitely won't have time for questions. So uh, I'm, I'm going to hang out, and you can talk to me afterwards. Um, I do want to start with um, kind of acknowledging the situation that's unfolding in Israel. And if you want to donate to Magen David Adon, that's the equivalent of the Red Cross in Israel. This is how you can do that. And if you send your receipts to me, I will match donations up to a total of $100. Um, so I want to teach you about how to build uh, good containers, right? Because building bad containers is pretty easy. Um, but before that, like, like, what is bad? What, what is good? Right? Like, what, what is good about containers? And like, you know, we all know the answer to what is good. Uh, it is to crush your enemies and to see them driven before you. Um, I'm sorry, that's a slide for the wrong talk. That's okay. So what is good containers? Okay. So we want them to be fast. Uh, we want them to be small. We want them to be secure and we want them to be usable. And those are like very high level things, but that's definitely not enough details. So uh, let's try to be more concrete. Uh, we want to make it easy for, to keep them up to date. Uh, we want builds to be reproducible. Uh, we want not to ship compilers in pod, which sounds way too specific, but it's way too easy to do that. So it's good to kind of have it as explicit uh, criterion. Uh, and we want to keep the size reasonably small. Eventually, we pay for sizes in some way. Uh, all right, we, we are going to pay for that, so we want to keep it reasonably small. So what does it mean to keep it up to date? Uh, we want to make sure that we have security updates, right? So that if there is a security issue in anything that's in dependency, we want to um, be able to um, rebuild it with a security update installed. Um, when? Right, so um, you know every single deployment environment will have its own constraints. On so like you know how fast are you supposed to ship a security update from the time it exists, uh, and that depends right on the specifics. And you want to be in control on exactly when you ship those security updates. You don't want them to happen uh, or when you don't expect them to. Um, we also want reproducible builds, right? That's kind of like a nice thing to aim for, which is the same code gives uh, 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 same results. And in theory, it is a really, really good thing to aim for. In practice, if you aim for the literal meaning of that, meaning like, you know, bit for bit compatibility, you end up spending a lot of work on very little gain. So we are willing to fudge it a bit, right? It's like, you know, we want to say that the same code gives equivalent results. Uh, we don't really care, for example, about like you know the timestamps and stuff. Again, some people care about literal reproducible builds, and that's fine. To actually aim for that in your average container build, it's just too much work for too little gain. Um, compilers in pod, um, that's a hilariously common anti-pattern, right? And we can think about why, right? Because as we try to install stuff, some of that will need a compilation stage. Uh, um, kind of a lot of kind of default things will just like install the compiler and then you find that you ship the compiler in the um, in the image, right? So it's really surprisingly easy to to get that stuff wrong. Um, when it comes to size, you quickly get diminishing returns. Um, you do want to save costs, right? Eventually, again, for every byte in your container image, you are going to pay. Right? It doesn't matter like exactly the way you pay it, right? You might pay upfront for like the disk and then fill it, or you might be paying literally per byte or some something in the middle. But eventually it is gonna cost you. Um, you want to support binary wheels, wheels uh, which means you want to both support installing them and building them, uh, because binary wheels are really good ways to get Python stuff. Uh, the way faster to install. Uh, and it really simplifies your images if you kind of uh, um, base them on binary wheels. Um, then, of course, for security, you want to make sure that your thing doesn't run its root. Um, it's not a perfect security solution for everything. It's general hygiene. It will definitely uh, um, put some defense in depth in case anyone ever breaches your uh, container to be able to get outside the container. Again, not perfect, but way, way better than not doing that. Um, 
And specifically, one thing you can do when you um, don't run this route is you want to make sure that the user you're running in as does not have permissions to pip install. Again, that will make anyone who tries to do lateral movement out of your container, uh, uh, their life will be a lot worse. Um, so we also want fast rebuilds because that's a, little, a lot about responsiveness, right? Uh, um, when someone is um, going to use whatever system you, you're using for containers, they're probably have gonna have to rebuild it a lot, right? Because like they're gonna fix and rebuild, fix and rebuild until they get it right. So you want to make sure that you, you do account for that use case. Um, and the first decision you need to make, so now we kind of understand like, you know, where we're going to aim, uh, how do we get there? The first decision you want to make is like the first line of your Docker file, which is from space and then something. Right? Uh, and, and kind of like, you know, uh, uh, basically like that's like the 90s uh, uh, distro world, kind of back. Um, I will try to kind of skip over the drama and give high level um, ideas about how to choose it. Uh, and ultimately, you're going to have to make that choice. Um, so the first thing you might want to think about is that you want to get like something that's reasonably small as a minimal server rest. But luckily, most modern distros have already figured out that people want containers, and they already have a reasonably minimal server. So while you can again debate which one has like the most minimal server, that ends up not being a huge criteria in how to do that. Um, if you do, Debian empirically is the easiest to get the smallest. Um, then you want to make sure that you have some sort of LTS support. Um, you usually want to aim for around five years. And the reason is assuming that they release the, it in like some kind of yearly or like you know kind of year and a half cadence. Um, at the point they release, uh, that's the point you're going to upgrade. But of course, you might not want to upgrade right then because you might want to take some time for that version to stabilize a bit. And then maybe six months later, uh, um, your company has a huge acquisition, and that's definitely not the right time to aim. So even if your original goal is more or less to upgrade as soon as a new version comes out. Uh, making sure that you have that LTS gives you breathing room uh, uh, to kind of, you know, don't wait until the five years are almost up to kind of start the upgrade process, but gives you breathing room to say, okay, when the new version comes in, we definitely start planning for that, but we account for like anything else we need to do. So that gives you enough time to upgrade. Um, you also want to kind of account for the volatility between like, you know, the stuff, right? Like how much do they change before they move to the next version? Um, usually you have security stuff, which is great. Um, how much backports they have might or might not be something you care about. Uh, what kind of bug fixes do they deem critical enough to kind of uh, put in? Again, this is something you want to look at, like how the distribution is doing, and you want to see what you need and make sure those two match. So here's kind of a quick run through like the popular ones. Uh, Debian has a five-year LTS. It's extremely conservative in what it allows between these LTSs. Um, Ubuntu, uh, slightly less conservative, also five years LTS. Uh, one good thing going for them is they do have an SLA on how soon they put out security fixes. If that matters to you, you want to think about that. Um, I usually recommend against Alpine. It uses Muscle, so it's not many Linux compatible, which makes it much, much easier to get your binary real stuff in a row. Uh, now we have Muscle Linux, so it's not as bad as it used to be. Muscle Linux is still not as kind of mature and popular as, as many Linux, which means you'll have a problem with upstream binary wheels, which means you'll have to like, you know, start rebuilding a lot of wheels yourself. Um, definitely not uh, the easiest thing to get started with. Uh, if you do use it, do use Muscle Linux wheel. Um, rolling releases are, are basically pure loss uh, in a container system, right? Because you're going to ship a new version anyway. You don't gain anything from the rolling release. What you do have is like it's a lot harder to only ship security updates compared to like, you know, what I shipped like, you know, two weeks ago, which means now I have potentially have to test a lot more if there's a security fix. So it's easier to keep them up to date, but you uh, uh, lose a lot in that updates can change pretty big things. Um, anyway, I just CentOS is rolling, so everything I say about rolling releases applies to CentOS. Um, recently, there's been like 
a few changes in this area. Uh, but there's enterprise Linux, uh, which basically like you can't use directly, but you can use uh, Rocky Linux and SUSE Linux. Um, by the way, you can use the commercial version of SUSE Linux. It is free to use for containers. So that means it, it does fall under the LTS uh, thing. Um, and you can use Alma Linux, which is technically not part of Enterprise Linux, but close enough for this level of high, high explanation. So now you've done with the form line, right? We've done one line, great, you know, awesome. <laughs> we have a lot more lines. Uh, um, and the next thing you want to think about is how do I get Python to the container, right? Like you, you know, potentially because you started with a minimal version, you did not have a Python on it. So now uh, you need to get some Python on it. Um, so uh, the one thing you don't want to do is like the equivalent of apt-get or dnf or yum or whichever one those use, uh, install Python. This is because the system Python really aims at distro packages, not at like your stuff, you know, um, it'll make it like a lot harder for you to upgrade Python versions you want. It'll make it a lot harder for you not to upgrade Python versions when you don't want. Um, you basically don't want that. So um, definitely not the system Python. Uh, it's not aimed at like, you know, user programs. Unless you're like building your stuff as part of like, you know, one of those things, it's not really aimed at you. Um, you might have like an appropriate repository. For example, if you're using Ubuntu, you can use the dead six PPA, which prepackages uh, Python in a really nice way for you. Um, you can use PyEnv. Uh, that builds and installs Python, but like also does a lot of other things. Um, and you don't need them, so basically PyEnv under the hood uses Python build. If you're gonna use PyEnv 90% of the time, what you wanna do is use Python build. It does the same, but doesn't do, do a lot of the things that PyEnv does, and would be very useful if you're using it as a version manager, but you're not because your container probably only has one version of Python. Um, or you can you know, do the source, right? Roughly that, right? Uh, um, grab it from somewhere, configure, make, make install, um, you know, give it, a bunch of parameters, and that's fine too, right? Like you'll probably want to uh, pre-install some stuff. Obviously, uh, remember that we don't want to ship uh, uh, compilers to production, so if we do that, we need to make sure that we don't ship the compiler that we use to compile Python for. Remember how I said it's very easy to get it wrong? This is one way to get it wrong. Um, if you are already going to build from source and you're already going to use Debian, uh, that's basically the Python colon uh, uh, Docker Hub images, so you can use those, uh, they're fine. Um, so when you talk about like building Python, um, you basically can trade off how much you control, like you know which Python version and so on, how much work it is, and how, much, uh, how many problems you're gonna have with it. Uh, um, that's a complicated trade-off curve, because it's like three-dimensional of plane, I guess. Uh, so uh, choose some point on it that is compatible with your needs. Um, right? Uh, you want to support uh, multiple versions of your container. Not multiple versions of Python in your container, but you probably want to build uh, multiple variations of your container with different versions of Python so that uh, when people build off of it, because you probably, like if you're going to put all this work, uh, probably going to use it for a handful of microservices. So when people shift them off, uh, they, they have a reasonable upgrade path. Um, two to three is a good number. Uh, less than two wouldn't be multiple. More than three is not manageable. Choose one of these numbers. Um, so I know how familiar you are with uh, container build in the abstract. This is not Python specific or anything, but uh, not a lot, some people have not uh, used multi-stage builds. So quick recap, um, when you do a multi-stage build, only one stage actually matters for the output, right? Like you could have theoretically only written this stage. So why have any stage that's not the uh, uh, last stage? Uh, because the other stage can help by kind of like uh, uh, building uh, partial stuff, right? So um, you can either use the previous stage as a starting image, but that's not super useful because you could have just, you know, collapsed them. So uh, the more co common thing you need is copy minus minus form. If you use copy minus minus form, that means you can build at one stage and then copy a different stage. For example, you can build Python into, say, opt something Python and then copy its form and then you don't have a compiler in your image. Right? That's great because you didn't want it. 
Um, so basically, you, kind of, uh, you can also use stages as modules, right? So that uh, um, basically, um, you don't have too much rebuilding if you are building mu multiple variations. Uh, that's less common, but probably deserves a mention because, and again, this is shows you how to install Python with AppGet, so that's not a good example for how to install Python. Oh, I'm using the PPA repository, so that's fine. Okay. Um, so um, when you're building from source, you want to uh, build separate variations of your container for build and one time, and you probably want to deploy um, upload both into whatever registry you're using because whoever will be building on top of your kind of Python based image will probably be really, will probably find your build image very useful, right? They shouldn't ship it, but they'll find it useful for, like, say, uh, building their own binary wheels in a previous stage for them. Um, so this is basically like how it might look, right? You do, like, you know, from Ubuntu's builder, you install build dependencies, you build Python, and then you can copy that. Uh, and, and you don't have uh, a compiler in your runtime, and you do have a builder, and then you can kind of build it twice and ship once the builder and once the runtime. Um, you do want to think about how to optimize your layers. Uh, that will matter both for how fast it is to kind of grab it from the registry and also how small they are. Um, so if you put everything under opt by org, uh, then you can use just one copy, and it will kind of copy everything into that, and that will make like every layer have some sort of readable semantic meaning, which is very useful. Um, after you build Python, if you do it yourself, uh, please uh, remove the tests, uh, any builder dependencies uh, in the runtime, and um, you can also like start to like you know going into details and and, and remove more. Um, again, uh, you get into diminishing returns at some point. Um, if you do have wheels that are not native, you want to build with the builder image, and then you can either copy them to runtime, or you can install them in a virtual environment and copy the virtual environment to the runtime. Right, so that's two alternatives. Either way, um, that will stop you from having to uh, have any compiler in the runtime, right? Because you build the, run the binary wheel, and either you use you know, the pre-installed wheel or the, uh, or the virtual environment. Um, I like that better than copying the wheels, because again, um, that keeps your runtime image uh, a lot smaller. Um, if you are uh, building binary wheels, you want to use them portable. Um, which means you'll have to use patch elf, uh, which is used to make will self-contain. Uh, you need a newer version that probably is in your um, upstream repository, so you'll want to find some way of grabbing that. There's, you can, you know, uh, there's a handful of ways to do that. Um, you're not gonna use patch elf directly, right? You have to have it installed so that audit will can work, um, but after you have patch elf ready, uh, you can just install audit wheel with pip. That's easy, that's simple Python dependency. Um, and then to get a self-contained binary wheel, all you need is to repair it. And you will have, um, that's, that by the way builds a self-contained binary wheel, not a portable binary wheel. Building portable binary wheel is a bit more complicated. Uh, but that at least removes a lot of the need for like binary dependencies. So um, that's a good way to get out of the need to install .so's in your runtime image. And again, remember, we care about the size and the complexity of the runtime image that reduces that. Um, if you are going to use uh, portable binary wheels, then you want to build them for the oldest thing you support. Luckily, you're in charge of that, right? Because you know exactly what, um, what is your support matrix, right? You, you decide on you know, what is the latest um, upstream distribution that you're using. Um, so um, basically, you just run it with like, you know, that platform. Um, again, I, this is an example for x86. You can also do it for ARM. Um, too much, too, too many variations to show, uh, but that equivalent thing can be done for ARM. Uh, and that will get you portable binary wheels. Um, that's useful if you're gonna like you know ship them to off to like you know um, a private dev PI that then you'll install from. So um, if you need to generate binary wheels um, for things that don't have upstream binary wheels for any reason, um, usually there's build instructions in documentation, and often it's a little bit of a um, 
you have to kind of figure things out as you go. Uh, luckily, after you figure things out, you can encode them in your, uh, in your Docker so that you don't ever have to figure them out again. But sometimes, like, you know, um, they have very loose documentation on exactly what build dependencies they have and exactly which compilers uh, uh, stack they need. Usually, they try to be good about it, but, you know, it's open source documentation, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, and then you need to build the dependencies. Um, so um, you do want to optimize layers, uh, which means you want to reduce how many times you use the copy instructions. Um, so uh, what I find well work is like you prep stuff at the build stuff, right? So you at the build prep, you kind of make sure that everything kind of fits together in one directory. So you know here you don't have any constraints about layers because you're not going to ship that. So you know do the right thing to do. Um, make sure that like you know your opt slash whatever directory looks good, and then you can just copy it over in one big chunk. Um, you want to optimize caching because that will uh, speed up uh, your CI speed. So you want to think about when to when and where to build your wheels, uh, and you want to think about what invalidates uh, um, caching, right? Um, and knowing how how Docker build thinks about in cache invalidation is important. Um, so as you read your Docker file, um, make sure that you do stuff like build your wheels before you copy over your Python source. That's really easy to get wrong because um, your requirements to txt and your Python source are probably very close to each other, and it's very tempting to copy them over in one bit. But if you do that, then as you install the, your requirements, uh, it will say, oh, but that, that depends on your Python source, and it probably doesn't. Your requirements txt probably change a lot slower than, um, than, your Python, than, than your actual Python code. So you want to copy your requirements txt, pip install that, and then uh, copy over your Python source code, um, maybe build the wheel, then install that wheel, um, minus minus no depth, and then like do kind of a pip validation that all the dependencies are installed. That's more complicated, but it will make sure that your Docker build is much friendlier to caching. So when you read your Docker file, you want to make sure that uh, um, it works that way. Um, so, um, here are like, uh, the takeaways that I hope you uh, take away from this talk. So um, getting it wrong is a lot easier than getting it right. There are a lot of moving pieces in building a container image, right? You want to think about your base, how you install Python, how you, uh, how you generate good images. Um, all of those things, like, you know, there's like five or six uh, choices to make. Together, there's like a matrix of like, you know, hundreds of choices. Um, and it's really easy. Most of that matrix is bad, right? Um, and even the parts in that matrix that are good or might, might be good for other people and not for your particular use case, right? So you have kind of a lot of red and a little bit of green. And, and like having that kind of like mental image is really, really important. Um, because if you get it right, you get a really amazing experience, right? You get a good experience of like how easy it is to ship security updates. You get a really good experience. <coughs> uh, you get a really, really good experience of how easy it is to ship coding upgrades. You get a really, really good experience of like wha how do, do how do I ship a simple bug fix without having to retest a lot of stuff, right? So it is worth it to think before you Docker, right? Like you know, it's really easy to start just writing your Docker file, and I think it is really worth it to sit down, think about all your choices, figure out what you need to do, and really put in the thought before you start writing. Um, that's it. Um, obviously, I could only touch on like so many things very, very lightly in the time I had. Um, I really recommend Itamar's series uh, on Python speed slash Docker. That's really, really good stuff that goes into every single thing I said here in like 10 times more details and will give you a lot more information and it's really well written. Uh, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much and I hope you found it helpful.